Turn to the prophet Isaiah chapter 1. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to read some very familiar verses here, verses 18 through 20. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Of course, we know this is the word of the Lord to the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. But we do agree that it is typical of the gospel message. And these verses are often quoted and often cited to uh, describe the character of the gospel. So we as a church, and I believe everyone that is truly born of the Lord Jesus Christ, believes that we ought to be about our master's business. Amen. We ought to be preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus, seeking to fulfill the great commission, going into the highways and the byways and compelling them to come into the house of the Lord. Now, I know in this hour what they teach people is, you know, to, to fulfill the Great Commission is for you to drop some money in the basket and let's give that to a missionary. And I do believe that we ought to fund missions. Amen. I believe that's an important part of the gospel and our vision ought to be for the entire world. We ought to be concerned about Africa like we're concerned about Woodville. Amen. So I believe we have an obligation to give and we have an obligation to sin. But just because we sin does not not release us from our obligation to go. We are to go beginning at Jerusalem. And it's so strange in this hour. People say they're filled with the Holy Ghost. They have grandeur ideas that they'll one day go on the mission field and preach the gospel and won't even witness to their next door neighbor. They're deceived. Amen. If you're truly filled with the Holy Ghost, you recognize that your obligation is to go and to go where you're at, wherever you're placed, to take the gospel, to carry it into this world world and to proclaim Christ in him crucified. But you know, as we go, I believe we have to ever be examining ourselves to make sure <clears throat> that we are of a proper spirit. And this is something that as a pastor, I'm constantly concerned with for us as a church. And why is that? Because my own experience in the years that I've gone and tried to fulfill that call to preach the gospel, I know that I have to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost, always allowing the light of the gospel to expose my heart or I'm an unfit vessel to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we see here in our text that God wants to reason with sinners. And that's what I want to talk to you here this morning. I believe the Holy Ghost wants to examine our heart a little closer closely here. And for us to come under the scrutiny of God's character and God's heart, even toward lost humanity, that we could repent and cleanse ourselves if there's anything contrary to the person of Jesus Christ in our gospel preaching. Now, the aim of gospel preaching is not merely to express the mind of God, though it certainly accomplishes that purpose. We would all agree with that. Neither is it nothing more than to denounce sin and to pronounce judgment upon the disobedient. And yet this so-called negative aspect of the gospel is despised by sinner and hypocrite alike. Let me tell you something here this morning. It is absolutely impossible for you and I to preach the Word of God, to accurately declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ without shaming and shunning sin and lifting up the truth, bringing error into the light. We had a man yesterday told us, we talked about offending people. He said, if you just preach the word, that'll be no problem. I'm here to tell you, if you preach the word, you're going to offend everything that's outside of the person of Jesus Christ. And if you don't, you're not preaching the word of God. 
You expect that. You recognize that. You're not out to be hated. You're not out to merely offend someone. But you know that that is a natural fallout of preaching the Word of God. Well, is it then you may ask to reveal the person of Christ? Speaking of preaching the gospel. Well, of course. Yes, it is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must ask ourselves, for what purpose is Jesus revealed? Why is Jesus lifted? it up that all men might be drawn unto him. I'll tell you here this morning, God's intention, his ultimate end, his primary plan is not merely to inform, but to recover, to recover all. Amen. He's not just trying to tie a few loose ends here and there, inform the sinner of what he is, and then kick him into hell. That's not the spirit of Almighty God. There's something at work. The gospel message is deep, calling unto deep, reaching out even to the worst, even the most abominable people, people like you and me, amen, people like you and me before we were born again, I deserve to go to hell, amen, thank God for his mercy, thank God that he had mercy upon me, that he was long suffering, that he sent someone to pray for me, that he sent someone to live this gospel before me, I deserve to go to hell, I didn't deserve a chance to get right. I didn't deserve for God to reason with me. I didn't deserve that. But thank God that he did. Thank God that he did. Amen. No, his intention is to recover. And let me tell you something. We have to foster and maintain a burden for souls. It's not just enough to say, I go. It's not just enough to say, I do. How many times do you preach a week? The, how, how do you evangelize? I preach on the street twice, three times a week. I go to the prison, the nursing home, whatever it may be. It's not just enough. We have to foster and maintain a burden. If not, listen to me. If we don't allow the Spirit of God to break up the fallow ground, then we can become calloused and cynical and jaded. Amen? We can become in sensitive not only to God but the plight of men that are lost I realize the primary thing the central thing of the gospel is Christ and Christ alone him exalted him glorified even souls is secondary but amen souls do have a part hey, thank God souls do have a part to glorify the Lord Jesus that's the gospel by f fully apprehending fully restoring falling man, amen, to God's original purpose. And listen to me, this morning I'm going to concentrate on the individual level. I know there's a corporate level, and when we speak of the corporate, you know, intention of God in the gospel, we recognize that he's apprehending a bride for his son. The church is central to that. But I want to concentrate on the individual level. There can be no church if men are not redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with men like you and men like me hearing the gospel, bowing our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and God in His infinite mercy granting you and I repentance. Now this being true, this is a fact that we need to recognize and understand. We must never forget that every soul that we come in contact with, every individual that we preach to, no matter who they are, no matter how sinful they are, is a potential habitation for God. Amen. Jesus shed his blood very purposely. Do you hear me? Jesus shed his blood for that sinner to apprehend him. I recognize again that ultimately he did it for the glory of God. But the Bible does say in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That little word for, amen, it indicates purpose. It indicates purpose. Purpose. How is he going to glorify God? By the salvation of man. Amen. By the salvation of man. Bringing creation back into subjection to the creator. Amen. This is, uh, this is impossible apart from a vessel to declare the gospel rightly. Amen. Now, you know, there's an apostate movement in America today. It's called the seeker sensitive movement or the seeker sensitive churches. And they erroneously declare that God is all about people. 
Have you ever heard them say that? Amen. It's one of their slogans. It's one of their mantras. Well, that's a lie. Amen. I said, that's a lie. That's Christian humanism, and it makes man the center of all things, that the sum total of the gospel is to make me happy, to make me fulfilled. Amen. Blessed, the Bible says, are those that hear the word of God and obey it. I'm fulfilled as I obey God. That is my fulfillment, and that's the heart of any real Christian. But the center of the gospel again is that God would be glorified. Self-denial is the first oracle of discipleship. It's not about me being happy. I'm to deny myself that he can be obedient, that I can be obedient to him, and that he can be exalted. That's what this gospel is about. However, let us not swing to the opposite extreme and deny the Scriptures by theologically assuming that God is disinterested, hardened, and aloof. And that's the danger for people like you and I. That's the danger for us. When there is so much, so much humanistic love preached from the pulpit, even from the most conservative preachers that make the sinner a victim rather than a culprit. And oh, we become grieved with that, and rightfully so, that we hear men talk about sinners as if they couldn't help themselves and things along that line. But you know, if we're not careful, if we don't guard our heart, then we'll forget, amen, where we came from. We'll forget that God indeed wants men to be born again, that he is long-suffering to usward. Aren't you thankful that God was long-suffering towards you, not willing that any should perish? He doesn't want Scott, the doorman at Illusions Club, no matter how blasphemous, no matter how wicked, no matter how religious, he doesn't want Scott to perish. He doesn't want Tamika, the stripper, no matter how wicked, no matter how unclean, no matter how impure. He doesn't delight in her death. He doesn't rejoice over her destruction. He wants to see her be brought to repentance. He desires that. That's his heart. Amen. Those young people out at Brookhaven that were blaspheming and mocking and belittling the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you say about that here today, preacher? God is angry with them. God's angry with the wicked each and every day. But he, amen, doesn't delight in their destruction. There's a fine and subtle line before, between that spirit of those two things. And rightly, accurately, Accurately representing God. Amen. He's long-suffering. You know what he'll do? He'll reason with them. He wants to reason with those people. He wants to talk to Scott. He wants to talk to Tamika. He wants to talk to those students at LSU. If we keep this scriptural truth ever before us, it will season our preaching with mercy. But the moment we begin to lose this thought, we begin to lose this vision of the character of God, then we are going to misrepresent the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, next Sunday, we're going to stand in front of a church service. We're going to stand in front of a church service where people are going to be speaking in tongues inside, and we're going to reprove them. And in essence, we're going to reprove them because they have lost their vision of who Jesus is. God forbid that we would lose our vision of who Jesus is. Amen? God forbid that we would have a skewed view of who God is. Amen? It will again, this truth, if we understand it, if we're illuminated in our spirit to this truth, it will again inspire a seek and save mentality to our evangelism that can sometimes be obscured, forgotten. Amen? It can be lost by repeatedly confronting hardened sinners. Amen. I speak that out of my own experience. Almost 20 years I've been preaching the gospel open air. Been beaten, spat upon, thrown from moving cars, jailed, whatever could happen. I constantly mocked and hey, I have to guard my heart. I have to guard my heart. I have to constantly allow the Holy Ghost to speak to me. There's never a time that I don't go on that street. There's never a time that I don't go to the Illusions Club that when I climb in that white 15-passenger van and I go home, I may have Charlie with me or somebody else, but when I drop them off, the Holy Ghost is there to talk to me. There to say something, to tweak, to say, now listen, you said such and such. 
that really isn't what I wanted you to say. Or you should have said this and you didn't. Whatever it may be, we must be taught of the Spirit of God. I've said that time and time and time again. And if you are, then you're going to be making progress. You're going to be moving forward. Amen? There has to be a seek and a save mentality. This truth will restore that intercessory edge that is essential, that is essential to accurately representing the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost, dying, and sin-loving world. We preach Christ to sinners, but then we go home and go to sleep, and he intercedes for them. Amen? I said, he, he's a praying, and he's seeking God the Father. Amen? He's interceding. And listen to me, when we can just denounce people and put them into hell and never even give a, th- a second thought to who they are and what's taking place, we need to be careful. We need to be careful. Do they deserve hell? You know that I believe that all sinners deserve hell. Are the victims? No. But God doesn't delight in the destruction of the wicked. And listen to me. The worst kind of hatred is apathy. That's the worst kind of hatred. When it just doesn't bother you. When it just doesn't matter. When you just can't be moved. When it doesn't trouble you. That's the worst type of hatred. Listen to me. Our obligation is to love all men. That's what we owe men. We owe to love them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to be, and listen to me, to be guilty of hatred, to be guilty of murder. You don't have to actively have hostility towards someone. All you have to do is fail to love them the way the Bible commands you to love them. So listen to me. Let us be humbled here this morning. Let's examine ourselves. Our gospel is not only going to be examined by what we say, but why we say it. Amen? Not just the words. It's easy to teach a parrot. Amen? The words. You can bring people in. Get them to memorize the Bible. Bring them on the street. They hear me preach. They hear someone else preach. They begin to preach the same things. That's easy. Listen to tapes, whatever. That's all good. I'm not against that. I believe that's part of discipleship. But listen to me. It's more than just saying, well, let's go down a little checklist. You said all the right things. What did I say that wasn't the Bible? Amen. Was it the spirit of the Bible? Was it the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ? Was it the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. And this is the most difficult area of discipleship in training and raising up people to be representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the outward. It's not the verbal that's a lot easier to teach somebody. Amen. In fact, it's impossible to teach this to somebody. They have to have a vital, living, passionate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to hear from God himself. But our text reveals this truth, that God's heart is always extended. The invitation is given. It's true. Amen. The reproof and severe reproof is oftentimes in order. In this hour, I believe you will bring most pastors, most quote-unquote evangelists, out into the open air where, where the evangelist should be confronted sinners and selling instead of selling tapes behind a pulpit bring them out there they would balk at the real presentation of the gospel they're novices at best at gospel preaching because they don't practice it and what you don't practice if you don't do the will of God you cannot know the doctrine but nevertheless knowing these things are true is there a brokenness in us is there a willingness to reason God wants to talk. He wants to deliberate. He wants to reason with lost humanity. This morning for our edification, we're going to consider this aspect of God's character that we might rightly preach the Word of God. We're just going to go right down the page here. In verse 18, God says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God not only commands sinners to repent, but he also invites them to reason. Let me tell you something. If you're going to reason with people, you're going to have to exercise patience. You're going to have to exercise patience, even with some of the worst sinners. That word reason means to argue, to decide. Isn't that funny? Because, you know, you hear people, we're not to argue with people. We're not to argue with people. 
They get that from Romans chapter 1 where it talks about debaters. If you're speaking the truth, you're not debating. Amen? You're contending. It's the man that's against the truth that's arguing, and he's the one that's wrong. Amen? But to reason means to argue, to decide, to justify, to convict, convince, correct, dispute, judge, plead, rebuke, and reprove. Amen? And so, listen to me, the heart of the Christian, where God dwells, should be aligned with the character of God, a desire to talk. Come, talk to me. Can I talk to you, mister? Come, let's talk. Let's reason together. Listen to me. That has to be your heart. If that's not there, a desire, if that's not manifest, when you're out there, then something is amiss in your spirit. You don't have the heart of God. God. This is without question the express mind of God, demonstrated not only in the Lord Jesus Christ, communicated not only in the Word of God, but throughout holy men all through church history. You read about the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 and 17, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. He didn't just stand up there and say you're Christ haters, Christ murderers you're on your way to hell I'm sure he said that but that isn't all he said I'm sure he said that but that's not all he said he disputed with them who were they? crucify him crucify him that's pretty blasphemous that's a, that's a pretty deep spiritual line to cross when you agree with the murder of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet God was long-suffering toward them and sent a man that was willing to plead and willing to reason with them. I want you to consider for a moment, what would you say constitutes divine intervention? Just think about it. What constitutes divine intervention? The need of humanity, speaking of sin, that's the great need of humanity. It was met with one single provision. Not many provisions, one single provision. What did God, what did God do? He sent His Word. That's what God did. That's the answer. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ. That's all He sent. That's all He'll ever send. And that's all anyone ever ever needs. Amen? Is the Word of God. So on the individual level, the pattern holds true. The only hope for any sinner is God's Word. Listen to me. There is no other hope for anybody, anywhere, any place, any time, but the pure Word of God. But that has to be given to them. There's got to be a vessel willing to reason, willing to walk, willing to suffer shame, willing to be persecuted, willing to be misunderstood, Understood, an individual that's willing to be led by the Holy Ghost under the Lordship of Christ to give that life-giving word. There has to be a vessel, amen, and we're to be that vessel, amen. Thus, God is willing to patiently reason with the sinner. Now, this is what I want to get across to you as your pastor, amen. We must not. We need to be careful. And, and time and time again, the Holy Ghost has dealt with me along this line in my own personal life. And now, as your pastor, I'm seeing this in this church from time to time, and it troubles me. That's why the Holy Ghost has given me this word here today to check us, amen, that we would be restrained by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. We must not dismiss the sin sinner simply because he blasphemes or flaunts his sin, amen, even though he does that. I'm not telling you, don't call it what it is. Call it what it is. Pronounce the judgment of God upon it. But be careful that you don't just simply dismiss, dismiss a sinner because you have become frustrated with his blasphemy. Thank God he didn't do that to you. I never met a man more wicked than I was. Have you? I haven't. I really haven't. I've never met the man more wicked than I was. Never have. And I know God was merciful toward me. I know God reasoned with me. He dealt with me time and time again. Again, I'm not trying. You know me, and you know what I believe. That reproof is essential. 
that correction can be severe, offensive, even brutal. Amen? But I can tell you this. If you can't one moment correct someone, one moment, be screaming if need be at the top of your lungs, saying the most terrible, probing, uh, 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 judgmental things, and the next moment say, Sir, please let me reason with you. You are lost and on your way to hell. Would you come? Would you let me talk to you? God will deliver you. God will set you free if you'll but repent. If you can't flow that quickly from one to the other, then you're not being led of the Holy Ghost. If it's always you're this, you're that, you're on your way to hell and nothing more. Listen to me. That's essential to the gospel. I recognize most people in the church today don't want to say that when it needs to be said, but the gospel is more than that. We need to be careful that we don't forget that. To get into the thinking, to agitate the conscience, to confront, if you will, the sinful theory of the sinner. Because he has a theory. He has an idea. He has a worldview. He has a religion, even if he's, if he's an atheist. He has a religious mindset, and there is a lie. You need to remember, just like at the foundation of liberty is truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. At the foundation of bondage of sin is always the lie. And the lie is calculated by the devil to silence and to soothe the sinner's inflamed conscience. Just like at a club. Here's the doorman or the dancer or the bartender and they're on the porch and they pace back and forth and someone's preaching to them and after 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, finally they've had enough and they begin to say and this is the lie. It comes pouring out. I've got to make a living. I've got to provide for my children. There, there's a reason why I'm here and not only that they're saying in so many words, the reason why I'm here is godly it's a good reason. It's a justification. Now, to reason with that sinner is to overthrow that lie with the Word of God. And every other lie, to bring him in under conviction by the law of God. We must learn to ally the sinner's conscience against himself, exposing the lies that strengthen the sin and the rebellion. Amen. We know that Jesus, what did he do? You read through the Gospels, he's constantly speaking in parables. What is that? He's reasoning with people by simple, simple illustrations, even in the face of hostile opposition. You read through, he's dealing with the Pharisees, and there's no doubt he re reproved them. And that's what we're dealing with 99% of the time in America is religion. Because this is a religious culture, and almost everyone claims to be a Christian. That's nothing but Phariseeism, and it, it, it deserves the, the severest reproof. But nevertheless, you find Jesus in the face of people that he already knew they would plot his murder. And he's still speaking parables children's stories to them trying to reach them amen time and time again i've seen this on the street you know I, I, I the other day i was watching ken hoven and he was at berkeley california you know berkeley california is one of the you know the the the, the greatest academic so-called greatest academic uh, institutions in america have to have a, a high iq and a very high sat and act test to be accepted there and uh, you know the student body there surely would be considered some of the most informed people and some of the most learned people uh, uh, on the West Coast, and here's Ken Hovind, and he's there speaking about creation, and I don't agree with everything that he says, but, you know, as you listen to uh, him take questions, and people stand up, and they say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a PhD in, in uh, you know, biochemistry, or I'm a PhD in genetics, and obviously these people are learned people, but the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, and it's an amazing thing to watch those men wax irrational for selfish reasons to believe a lie simply because they love their sin they're willing to publicly make fools of themselves well you know as Ken Hovind is reasoning with them what's taking place it looks like nothing's taking place it looks like that those men there that they're hardened in their position and so many of them may be but I can tell you if there's anybody there that's sincere anybody there that has a heart to understand
understand, to recognize, they will see that's absolutely absurd. One man said the reason that we have back pain is because we used to be chimpanzees. And you know, uh, Ken Hovind, he really took that to the hilt. Said, is that right? Is that, is that the evidence that you believe, the, the, the evidence for you believing that, that, that out of rocks come human beings? And everybody laughed. And, and he really, you know, just showed how absurd, how stupid that was. He said, mister, I want to show you where you're moving from fact into religion. You're moving from science into faith. But they wouldn't believe it. But if there was anybody there, listen to me, that was open to receive, I promise you there was a, a glimmer of truth, a glimmer of hope that could appear through the darkness and God could deal with them because a man was willing to reason with them. Well, they were frustrating. They were wicked. And I believe you ought to say a few more things to them. I think you ought to really bear, bear the gospel truth a little more to them. But you know, he just didn't stand up and say, you're all a bunch of fools. You're all a bunch of foolish God-haters. And you're on your way to hell and dismiss himself. No, he didn't do that. He reasoned with them. I believe it would have been all right to say, you're all God-haters. And that's why you're acting the way you act. But then to try to reason, if possible, if men will talk to you, you need to want to talk to them. You need to find out, amen, to get into that thinking, to unravel the web of deception by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Listen to me. Gospel preaching presses God's reasonable claims up on the center, appealing to his conscience and exposing the refuge of deceit. That has to happen. It's not enough just to say what the sin is or to claim or call the sinner what he is. Amen. We've got to to get in to that heart by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Thus, evangelistic preaching is often a one-sided conversation addressing commonly held misconceptions, objections, and delusions. You know, how many times have you heard me at the Illusions Club as I'm preaching and I say, you might say to me tonight, preacher, as I'm talking to the doorman, you know what I'm doing? I'm attempting to reason with that sinner. I am anticipating the lie and the Holy Ghost will lead you in this way for you to decipher what's in the heart of that sinner by the Holy Ghost and you, you don't have to be a prophet. You don't even have to have the gifts of the Holy Ghost to know that. Amen. The devil's not too creative in his lies. They believe what you and I believe when we were lost. They're the same excuses we had. We have experience. We know what to think. Amen. But we've got to reason. Then a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mr. Sinner can be just as effective, sometimes even better. Amen. As we go forth and preach, listen to me, then there are those that are convicted, drawn, repelled, agitated. Amen. Persecution. I've seen some of the best conversations come out of people that threatened to kill me before they, before they came under and got convicted. But listen to me, you have to be willing to reason with people. You have to be willing to talk to them. I can remember one time we were in the prison. We went to the prison after Sunday services, and we drove up to uh, to uh, Macomb, but it's the other little community outside of Macomb. Uh, Macomb, I forgot the name of it. But we preached in a, in a uh, uh, county prison there on Sundays in between service. And the guards there would just let us in and shut the television off. Well, how many of you know what comes on Sunday afternoon in the fall? NFL football. Ooh, they didn't like us coming in during that football game and then turning the television off. They didn't like it. I mean, it put us on bad ground from the get-go. So every time we went in there, and we were thankful that they did that. We, fine, turn it off. But it was a little rough because they were very agitated already when we went in. Well, one time, I wasn't there this time, but uh, there was some brethren there, and they had told me about this. They went on a Sunday and were preaching, and there was one man. He became irate. He just started going, going around and flushing the commodes, have an open kind of barrack style uh, cell there, and just flushing commodes, screaming like he was demon possessed. They kept rebuking him, and finally they just had to ignore him and keep preaching, but it was very, very difficult for them to preach over him, and he just gave them the trouble the whole day. Well, it was a county jail, and so men were there for drunken driving, and maybe they were getting in or getting out of prison, and so a lot of them were in there a week or two, and they're out, and that was kind of a big turnover. You'd go there one week and never see people again. Well, what happened was they came back the next week, and they told him, said, that man 
last week that, uh, that, that opposed you all. He got out of jail like the day or the next day, and somebody caught him on the street that had, uh, 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 you know, something against him, and they almost killed him. They beat him almost to death, and he's in the hospital. We got wind of it. And those men, they left that prison after they preached that day, and they went to that, pri- they went to that hospital and visited that man in his hospital bed. And when they walked through the door, he began to weep. And he said, this has happened to me because I opposed you. And they were able to minister the truth of the word of God to him. Was he open last week? Mm -mm. Was he open after he got beat? Mm -hmm. But you know what those men were willing to do? They were willing to reason with him. They were willing to go the extra mile with a man that had opposed them preaching the gospel. Listen to me. What's the application for you and I? When we're out here and someone is blaspheming, I I realize, listen to me, there's no way to set a hard, fast rule for this. There's no rigid law we can apply. We must be led by the Spirit of God. But I can tell you this. If you can't, as you preach to someone the next moment, say, come talk to me. If there's not a brokenness, then perhaps you better shut up. Amen. Perhaps you better hold your peace and get full of God before you start trying to deal with people. Be slow to speak and quick to hear. Amen. Ministry that is Holy Ghost directed will always possess a redemptive quality. Remember in Galatians 6 and 1 and of course we apply this to the church and to brethren but it says brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault. Didn't say a Christian said a man if a man be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted do I believe that as regards to the ministry of restoration to people that backslide or fall into sin yes but I believe the principle is also true when we're dealing with sinners you better remember where you came from don't you forget where you came from you know, the Bible says in Titus chapter 3, it says, For we ourselves were also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. Amen. How many agree that was you? That was me. That defined me. And I didn't sometimes, I all the time live like that. That's the way that I lived all the time. And you know what the next verse says? But... After that, but after that, not before that, after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared. Aren't you glad that God ministered to you and reached out to you when you deserved to be cut off? Now listen to me. We've got to declare the truth. We've got to declare God's judgment against sin. But there always has to be that yearning to see men redeemed and a willingness to come down and talk to them face to face as God put on flesh and came down to reason with men face to face. He didn't just throw a Bible out of the sky. Amen. He came down to reason with them. Amen. And we've got to be willing to reason with him. We need to learn to be patient with people. Even with people that deserve for the ground to open up and swallow them into hell right now. And that's a lot of people that we talk to day in and day out. Remember, listen to me. We've got to get past the personal affronts and insults. This is so very, very important. Amen. You've got to learn this. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how long you've been born again. If you've never gone on the street and never experienced the pure, undefiled, undiluted hatred of a world against Christ, when you confront them in their sin, you're going to have to be raised up and strengthened in that. You're going, listen to me, the tendency is to become personally offended, to find it as a personal affront to your character. And then out of that, to use the Bible to strike back 
rather than releasing people and standing in the steed of the Lord Jesus Christ and being jealous for him. And yes, we can say the most, I'm not the world, listen to me, I'm not looking for their approval. They may think I hate them. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what he thinks, amen? I expect them to say that I'm preaching hatred. I'm not looking for them to approve. But I listen to me, just because I don't care whether the world thinks or what they think about my preaching doesn't matter. That I don't think what he, I don't, I don't, I'm not concerned about what he thinks. I am concerned. I want to please God. I want to be in the person of Jesus Christ. Remember that language is a tool. It's a tool that God's given us to communicate. Above all things, the highest form of communication is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has given us language to communicate. Amen. We must never use it as merely a weapon. To avenge personal offense. How do I know about this? How, how, how can I find out? Because the Bible says the word of God will cut asunder. Amen. It'll divide. It'll pierce. It, it, it'll discern the thoughts, the intents. And it will divide and cut between soul and spirit. This is why I'm saying you better have an ear. If you get in your automobile, you go home after you have called people fornicators, drunkards, and whores, and the Holy Ghost doesn't deal with you, and the Holy Ghost doesn't speak speak to you and the Holy Ghost is not stopping you in your tracks and dealing with your spirit whether right or wrong if that's not happening with you friend listen to me you're probably on dangerous ground and I can tell you something I'm going to just touch on this this is a delicate issue because it can be misunderstood what I'm going to say here I'm not afraid to use the word whore it's a Bible word Amen? I used it several times Friday night because that's what I was preaching to, whores. I'm not ashamed to use that word. But I can tell you what, I use it when it's appropriate. Now, you might say, well, everybody today is a whore. Probably right. Just about everybody is promiscuous. But when you use a word so much, and you just use it every situation because somebody didn't dress exactly the way you think they ought to be dressed or what have you, you belittle the power of such a word. You reduce its influence. You see, I'm not going to sit here and say, don't call anybody a whore, because I know the Holy Ghost will call people whores. Amen? I know the Holy Ghost is going to use me probably in the next three or four weeks to call somebody a whore. But I am saying this, be careful, that you're just not using that word because it's the most offensive thing that you can say to somebody. And that really deep down inside that you just don't like them or you just are frustrated with them. And so just say something because they won't react and they won't respond. And maybe I can just wake them up by calling them the most hard, severe, offensive thing that I can. Listen to me. I've been dealt with along those lines. I've had the Holy Ghost search me along those lines. That's all I'm saying to you here this morning. Be careful. You hear me? Be careful. You are to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. You are, be a, you are to be an ambassador for him. Be under the restraint of the Spirit of God. Be under the Lordship of Christ. The second thing I want you to see here, amen, in verse 18 and the latter part, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, you know the popular church today, they, they don't like to say the first part. They don't mind saying the second part. They don't mind preaching promises, but they don't like to preach conditions. So they have no problem communicating, amen, you'll be as white as snow. Amen. You'll be like wool. They, they preach that but they don't like saying though your sins be as scarlet no no they don't want to talk about that but now listen to me so we know that that's true but let us not be you know recoil to the opposite extreme and we love to say though your sins be as scarlet we're going to preach that amen because if men don't see their sin they don't they don't recognize they need a savior from sin but let's not be afraid to say they can be as white as snow it's part of the gospel. The biblical evangelist must not only expose sin, but he is to reveal mercy. 
to mercifully provide the sinner with what he is unwittingly evading. And that's what, listen to me, the universal experience of every single sinner, past, present, and future, is he is running from God. That's everything that I was, everything about me, my whole life at the core. I was running from God, evading the light, utterly deceived. Amen. To offer a sin consciousness, if you will, to the wayward and to the lost by giving them God's definition of sin. Amen. This enlightens them to the fact that they need to be saved or delivered. Amen. We need to be tenacious. We need to be patient. We need to plow through difficulties. Yes, we need to. Cr- Listen to me. I'm dealing with being frustrated. We When you become frustrated and discouraged, when you deal with hardened sinners week after week, night after night, day after day, the same excuses, the same lies, the same blasphemous things, the same things that lying false teachers and lying false prophets and pastors told them, the thing you heard last week, be careful that you don't become frustrated. That you hunker down. That you stay in Christ. That you deal with that sinner like the only sinner you've ever dealt with. Like you were dealing with your own soul. Like you were dealing and like you would want someone to deal with you. Yes, we must show them that their sins are black as midnight. But just as importantly, we must communicate God's power and his willingness to cleanse them. Oh, yes. You've got to believe that right here today. They were filthy. They were wrong. They were wicked. They were violating. Even as God spoke through the prophet, they were violating the commandments of God under the declaration of God's word. They had a bad heart. They had a wrong heart. They had drifted. They had backslidden. They had rejected the word of God. And while they did, God told them about it. But he said, you can be clean. I'll cleanse you. I'll make you white as the driven snow. It's not enough to inform the whore that she's a whore, though she must be told. And I agree. Amen. Or the drunkard that he's a drunkard. We must also declare that Jesus can make them free. And you know, in my own life, listen to me, this is my experience. This is the way the Holy Ghost deals with me. When I'm out of the Illusions Club or I'm out at LSU or wherever I am preaching the gospel, the Spirit of God, if I'm really submitted to the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God will remind me, you must declare that I will liberate them. Don't forget, I will liberate them. You see, that's what it is, being led of the Holy Ghost. You have to be sensitive, circumcised. To If you're just plowing along 30 minutes and an hour, just rambling Scripture, here, just because you're quoting Scripture doesn't necessarily mean you're led of the Holy Ghost. Are you cognizant? Are you conscious that you're under the Lordship of the Holy Ghost? Is he saying, wait, stop, speak, hold your peace? And if not, are you just reacting to what the sinner is doing? You know what we're going to condemn? We're condemn folks because they're like this in the pulpit. You know what they do? They react to the crowd. Listen to me. The devil will play us like little puppets. He knows we're going to rebuke somebody. So you know what he might do? He might say, you know what? Just insult them. Just threaten them. Just blaspheme up and down, back and forth. They'll forget their purpose, and they'll just start railing on you. They'll get out of the Holy Ghost. Nobody can really tell because, amen, we know the Spirit of God would rail you anyway. He's going to rail on you. He's going to rebuke you. See, we need to be mindful of the devices and the schemes of the devil. You don't think the devil could do that? You don't think there could be a person there that really is in their heart prepared? Maybe God's been dealing with them. You don't think the devil would come and try to stir and rile that person up and try to get that person in front of someone that's not really, you know, uh, conditioned or matured or submitted to the Lordship of Christ and see if they can't push their button? You don't think the the devil would do that? Oh, yeah, he will. That's why, listen to me. 
How, how do we know? It's hard to know. That's why I'm telling you, we all have a responsibility to be full of the Holy Ghost. It's not that next week we're going to go out and you're going to say somebody come out of stripper comes out that she's a whore and I'm going to be offended with you and think that you're in the flesh. Does everybody understand that? Everybody hear me? No, no, that's not. I don't, I'm sensing, you know, from time to time in my walk with God, I sense that in my own life. And as a pastor, I sense it in this church. And I'm telling you right now, as your pastor, we need to be careful. You hear me? We need to be careful. We need to check ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. We need to make sure that we're under the Lordship of Christ. The last thing here this morning, the biblical evangelist must not only preach judgment, he must declare redemption. It says in verses 19 and 20, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And do you see the double-edged sword that's revealed there? It must both be proclaimed. And I reckon recognize that there can be emphasis. I understand that. I, I realize if I'm speaking to a hardened, blasphemous man, that, you know, a rebellious, a rebellious individual, a rebellious group of people, the book of Proverbs says a cruel messenger can be sent to him. I understand all those things. But I'm saying if there's a pattern of, not, of us not revealing, of us just falling into a rut of frustration and discouragement because we are rarely met with positive positive, visible results, then we're not in the spirit, we're in the flesh. Because we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. I'm not just going to react what they're doing. There may be something deeper going on here. Amen? Just because they're all blaspheming or just because, you know, there's a sodomite dancing around and blaspheming God. I'm not, to, he needs to be reproved. But you know, it's just not, if you're just a slave to reacting to what they do, then we're no different, listen to me, than that pragmatic crowd that meets all across America this morning. Now, I fully realize sinners never genuinely appreciate grace before they tremble before God's holy law. That's an absolute. I believe that with all my heart. Nevertheless, we should be mindful to also declare of, t of Calvary. And Calvary testifies of God's willingness to liberate, to deliver, and to restore. God didn't cloak it. Amen. He did it on a hill before all humanity. And it is to be declared. Christ in Him crucified. He didn't veil it and wait till sinners were good and ready for that truth to be revealed. I understand the Spirit of God to really apply that to the heart. The law has to prepare, bring, be a schoolmaster to bring a man to that revelation. Listen to me though. We need to communicate that truth that Jesus died to deliver. That he will restore. There is grace. To be totally delivered from sin, a man has to see two things and submit to two truths. Number one, the truth of repentance. What is, what is repentance in a nutshell? That God commands you to stop sinning now. That's not preached on anywhere. They say repent, but they don't really believe that anybody can stop sinning, even through grace. So it's impossible to preach repentance, because that's what, in a nutshell, repentance is. Men have to be brought to the place where they realize, look, that's impossible. That's crisis, friend. When a human being realizes, I've got to stop sinning, that's crisis. That's impossible. You can't turn over a new leaf. You've got to have grace. Only Jesus can do that through a man. But a man must realize that, and he must embrace it and say amen to it. But secondly, for a man to walk in holiness, he's got to be convinced that God longs to strengthen him to do so. Oh, yes. You know, I know something. I know that God will forgive me no matter what I do. Listen to me, that doesn't give me a license to sin. But I do know that God will forgive me if I will repent. I know that God wants me to overcome every sin. I know that. I know that's his heart toward me. I know it. I know it. I'm sure of it. If I wasn't sure of that fact, amen, I would never remain in Christianity. I'd be sifted out. It's a truth that you must be convinced of. 
that God is for you, not against you. Listen to me. If you're playing games, you're a hypocrite. No, no, you're not even under God. But I'm telling you, if you want to do the truth, if you fall, you get up and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will give you strength to overcome. You've got to believe that. Now, if that's true for you, then how are they going to get born again if they don't believe that? That's an essential part of the gospel, that they have to realize that God, I knew I was a God-hater, a wicked man. And as the Spirit of God dealt with me, I knew that I was on my way to hell. I knew that God's wrath was upon me, but I knew there was an invitation extended to me that if I would come, he'd forgive me. That if I would come, he would deliver me. That if I would come, he would take up residence inside me. I knew that. And that, listen to me. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And that goodness is Jesus. And in the character and person of Jesus are all these things that we discussed here this morning. Stand with me. Hallelujah. I want us to come in these altars as a church, and I want us just to examine ourselves. I'm not speaking to one particular individual here. I'm speaking to all of us because we all go. We're all capable. Listen to me. We're all capable of crossing this line. Brother Britt, I ask you a question. Have you ever crossed that line? To my shame, I have. Have I crossed it in uh, times recent? Yes, I have. To my shame, I have. And God has had to deal with me. As always, do I ever have to cross that line again? Absolutely not. I can be kept perfectly in the Spirit. But I do know, listen to me, I do know I have to ever keep my heart open before God that I can be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Let's come in these altars and let's ask him. Just ask him to search, to try, that we want to represent him rightly, that we want to represent him rightly, that we want to have the word of the Lord, that we, we severity, we're, we're, we're willing to say anything that needs to be said. We're willing to be hard if hardness is appropriate. But we're also willing, amen, to cherish, to, to reach out, to love, to extend mercy, to be kind, amen, to be kind if need be, to invite, to, to invoke, to exhort, to admonish, whatever is needful. That we're willing, we're vessels, we're just, we're clay in the hands of the potter, that we would be molded, that we would be shaped according to his perfect will, that we just want to be vessels. If we, if we never open our mouth again or we never say anything hard, it doesn't matter what we, we just want to be a conduit of blessing. Oh, Father God, deal with us as your people, Lord. We know, Lord, we're called to be vessels of blessing, vessels of light, to carry the life-giving gospel of Jesus to our community, Lord God. And we want to be in a right spirit, Father. Search us, try us, give us light, most holy God. Give us light. If there be anything in any of us, any motive, Lord, we don't know our heart, but we submit ourselves to you. Search us and try us. The the intentions, the motives. Deal with us, Lord God. We want a right spirit. We want the fruit of the Holy Ghost. We want to be under the authority of God, under the authority of your Spirit, Father. Oh, fill us afresh with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Cleanse this vessel, Lord. We offer the body of this church, this local church, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Send the fire, Lord. Lord, send the rain, most holy God. Deal with this, Lord. Purge out the chaff. Burn it with fire unquenchable. Sanctify us. Meet for the master's use, Lord God. We ask you in the name of Jesus, do a work of grace in us, Lord. You said if we would follow you, you would make us fishers of men. And Lord, we submit ourselves to you here this morning. Make us fishers of men. Give us wisdom. He that winneth souls is wise. Oh God, give us a burden. Break us, Lord. Let there be a brokenness, a concern. Lord, intercession, a weeping, and a crying for lost humanity. A zeal for thy house, most holy God. Deal with us, Lord. Deal with us by your Spirit. 
and by your word in the name of Jesus. Come on and just cry out to the Lord God. Ask him to search you. Just submit yourself to him. You, you can't understand your motives. You can't know those things. It's only as the illumination of God's spirit shows you. Just submit yourself to him. Give him your will. Say, Lord, I want to be that vessel. I want to be right. I want to say right things. I want to be in a right spirit. I want to represent you rightly, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. So long I had searched for life's meaning, enslaved by the world and my grief. But 
the door of my prison was opened by love for the ransom was paid I was free I'm free from the fears of tomorrow I'm free from the girl down the past I've traded my shackles for a glorious song I'm free praise the Lord free at last so long I've searched for life's meaning enslaved by the world and my greed but the door of my prison was opened by love for the ransom was paid and I was free I'm free from the fears of tomorrow I'm free from the girl down my past and I've traded my shackles for a glorious song I'm free praise the Lord free at last I am free from the guilt that I carry from the dull empty life I'm set free For oh, when I met Jesus He made me complete He forgot the foolish man I used to be I'm free from the fears of tomorrow I'm free from the girl down my past I've traded my shackles for a glorious song I'm free praise the Lord free at last sing it again I'm free from the fears of tomorrow I'm free from the guilt of my past I've traded my shackles For a glorious song I'm free, praise the Lord Free at last Give the Lord a hand clap of praise Amen Praise God I want to stay in the right spirit. Hallelujah. Only way that happens is got to stay before Jesus. Amen. Have to desire that. Want that. We want to ac- ac- accurately represent Him. Amen. We're going to be in just as much trouble if we misrepresent Him as that crowd that we criticize out there. And rightfully so. Amen. They're condemned because they misrepresent God. But so will we. And rightfully so if we misrepresent Him. Amen. We, we say we're on high ground if we're going to correct somebody else. Amen. Then judgment must begin right here. Amen. We need to make sure that before we speak, we're right. God bless you. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock for prayer. Hug somebody as you go. We will see you, Lord willing, this evening. Amen.